Summer 2005. US and coalition forces were battling through the fourth year of Operation Enduring Freedom. While few envisioned an end to the overall mission in Afghanistan anytime soon, there was some hope in the form of the impending parliamentary elections scheduled for September of that year that rather remarkably for Afghanistan would include female candidates. However, the various anti-coalition militias that had sprung up, comprising of members of the Taliban, the Al-Qaeda terrorist network, and various other factions opposed to Western influence in their country, were determined to stop the elections which they saw as ungodly. Recognizing this, coalition forces in Afghanistan took proactive steps to clamp down on some of the most radical factions and their leaders in the months building up to September. This would lead to one of the deadliest days in the history of the United States Special Forces, where a force ultimately comprising 20 men would be wiped out, save for one, a sole survivor. This is Operation Red Wings. Welcome to Wars of the World. The objective. Among those targeted by coalition forces in the summer of 2005 was one Ahmed Shah. Shah heralded from the Kuz Kunar district of Nangahar province, and upon the arrival of Western forces in Afghanistan following the 9 11 terror attacks, he fought to oust the Taliban and their Al Qaeda supporters. However, in the years that followed, he increasingly opposed US and coalition intervention and helped bring Islamic fundamentalist fighters from abroad to Afghanistan. Taking him out of the picture, therefore, was a high priority. By early 2005, Shah had assumed command of a militia group known as the Mountain Tigers, operating in the Kunar province, located along the Pakistani border in eastern Afghanistan. While much of central and western Afghanistan had largely been secured by coalition forces by this time, at least enough to label elections in those regions as fair. The lands along the border with Pakistan were another story. With pro-Taliban and Al-Qaeda factions harboring anti-coalition militia on the Pakistani side of the border, it was a difficult and frustrating task for the coalition to secure these provinces, since leaders like Shah could have his fighters hop back over the border for rest, resupply, or to escape major coalition offences before returning. The only saving grace for coalition leaders was that many of these militia groups were equally fighting for power among themselves, negating a coordinated effort against them. Shah's Mountain Tigers were one of 22 known groups operating in Kunar province in the summer of 2005. These comprising rival Taliban groups, groups with terrorist links or simply criminal factions who looked to take advantage of the chaos. To help protect him, Shah began operating under the name Mohammed Ismail and he proved something of an elusive foe, and with aircraft and drones failing to field any tangible leads, the decision was taken to send in elite special forces teams to scout known or suspected hideouts used by Shah. Dubbed Operation Red Wings, the name adopted from the Detroit Red Wings hockey team, the plan was conceived by the US Marine Corps 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines with principal planning being undertaken by the battalion's operations officer, Major Thomas Wood, Red Wings was to comprise of five phases. Phase one would require a special forces team to be inserted and investigate buildings suspected of being in use by Shah. Once Shah was identified, phase two could begin with the insertion of a direct action team by special forces helicopters to ideally capture Shah or if necessary, kill him. And phase three and four concerned supporting forces including the Afghan National Army securing the surrounding area to prevent either Shah escaping or interference from other anti-coalition groups, while the final phase would focus on the extraction of the teams. Phase one of Red Wings was to be a joint operation conducted by members of the US Navy's elite SEALs, who would be inserted by the US Army Special Operations Command's 160th Airborne Specialist Operations Aviation Regiment, the Night Stalkers. On the night of June 27, 2005, 
the 160th would insert the SEALs using their mighty Boeing MH47 helicopters, a special operations derivative of the famous CH-47 Chinook heavy lift helicopter. While the SEAL team only comprised four members, a second MH-47 was to be involved in the operation, with the goal of acting as a decoy to mislead local insurgents. Marcus Luttrell Among the SEAL team that night was Navy Hospital Corpsman 2nd Class Marcus Luttrell of SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 1. Luttrell was born in Houston on November 7th, 1975 and was raised on a horse farm, where his father himself was a former Navy man and Vietnam veteran who taught his children to live off the land. Together, Marcus and his twin brother Morgan learned how to build shelters, to fish, shoot, scuba, and to kill, butcher, and roast wild boars. From an early age, Luttrell was determined to become a member of the US military special forces, his natural drive and ambition pushing him to be the best. His preparation for such a life began early in less than official circumstances. Living near the Luttrell's farm was US Army veteran Billy Shelton, and from the age of 14, he began training Luttrell and his brother, devising an intensive course of physical activities to prepare them for military service. Luttrell started his career towards being America's elite in March 1999, when he enlisted in the US Navy. After graduating from boot camp and hospital corpsman, A school, he began to undertake his SEAL basic underwater demolition training, joining class 226. However, after he fractured his femur, falling from a rope, he was held back to recuperate, eventually graduating with class 228. Further training included the Army's jump school, his SEAL qualification training, and he attended the Special Operations Combat Medic course. On April 14, 2003, he along with SEAL Team 5 deployed to Iraq as part of Operation Iraq Freedom, weeding out resistance from elements still loyal to Saddam Hussein's regime following the US-led invasion. He then turned his hand to the location and destruction of improvised explosive devices or IEDs, the use of which at the time was growing in frequency and proving highly effective. After a brief respite, he joined SEAL Team 10 prior to its deployment to Afghanistan in 2005, whereupon he learned he would be participating in Operation Red Wings. Joining him on June 27, 2005 was Lieutenant Michael Murphy, who was in command of their operation. Sonar Technician 2nd Class Petty Officer Matthew Axe Axelson, an eagle-eyed sniper and gunner's mate 2nd Class Danny Diet Jr., a communications officer and spotter. Even before the operation got underway, Luttrell would later remark that he had a bad feeling about it from the start, as the powerful MH-47 thundered its way through towards its landing zone, on a ridge near the Sortolo Sar mountain, in the Hindu Kush mountain range, roughly 20 miles or 32 kilometers west of the provincial capital of Asabad, his trepidation only grew. As he later explained in an interview, what I couldn't see was a place to hide. We did not have good intel on the vegetation. It was obviously bad and barren, way up there in the Hundo Kush, around 10,000 feet. After dropping off its passengers, the MH-47 and the decoy aircraft thundered away, leaving behind the four seals, who began to trudge their way for four miles through sodden mud and freezing rain. Soon Luttrell's fears were proved founded. Approaching a village known to be sympathetic to the Taliban, they found the moon appearing in full bloom above them casting their shadows across the featureless mountain behind them, for all to see. But thankfully they escaped detection, at least for this time being. An Impossible Battle Having taken up their positions above the village, the SEAL team settled in and began locating buildings suspected of housing either Shah, his men, his weapons, or his IED factory. Now well concealed on the hillside, the trowel was peering through his binoculars, when to his shock, a turbaned man leapt down off a log, above where he was hiding, and landed straight in front of him. Luttrell and Axelson both drew their rifles and pointed them at the terrified Afghan, who had no idea the seals were there until he was staring down the barrels of their weapons. Two other men suddenly appeared, and were immediately apprehended by the seals, whereupon Luttrell and the others realised they were simply goat herders, rather than scouts for Shah, as initially feared their animals now circling around their position, and who could clearly be seen from below. They were now presented with a dilemma, whether they were working for Shah or not, 
These goat herders had compromised the SEAL team's security, since they had knowledge of their size and location. However, because the men were unharmed, their rules of engagement forbid them from shooting them. But they also couldn't keep them captive for the duration of the operation. At first, Lieutenant Murphy chose to kick the decision upstairs and attempted to contact his senior officers for advice on what to do. Unfortunately, the train made it difficult to transmit effectively and they were unable to reach anyone, leaving Murphy to have to make the decision for himself. Citing the possible legal and political repercussions for killing the three goat herders and the fact that doing so could in of itself alert the local population to their presence. If anyone heard gunshots or screams of agony, Murphy felt he had no choice but to let the men go. As a precaution, however, he ordered the team to relocate to their fallback position. They had been on the move for less than an hour when suddenly they came under attack. The goat herders had warned Shah and his men wasted no time in scrambling to attack them, knowing they had numerical superiority over the four-man team. Knowing what would happen next, Lutral has since expressed regret over not killing the three goat herders to prevent the deaths of so many of his comrades. But hindsight is of course 2020. Equipped with heavy machine guns, rocket-propelled grenade launchers, and even an 82mm mortar, Shah's men launched a fierce attack on the seals from three sides. Lutral remembering the start of his firefight when he spotted a hostile fighter appearing from behind a tree and he dispatched him with a round to the head. Shah's men were relentless, determined to kill the SEAL team, whose only advantages were having the higher ground and their own skill and tenacity. Unfortunately, they couldn't hold out forever and thus Murphy ordered them to fall back, which in this context, Lutral knew meant jumping off the mountainside into the nearby ravine and attempting to escape as Latrell attempted to zigzag his way down to avoid being hit by the intense incoming fire, he suddenly fell, slipping in the air before barreling downwards, desperately trying and failing to grab hold of anything to stop his fall. His supplies, helmet and gear were ripped away from him as he fell, before finally coming to a rest at the bottom, followed by the others, who again sought cover in order to continue fighting. Dietz picked up the radio and attempted to call for help, but before he could, he was shot in the hand. The blast shattered his thumb. Despite his own serious wounds, Murphy knew their only hope was to establish contact with headquarters, but he also knew this would be impossible in the extreme terrain where they were fighting. Therefore, without hesitation, and with complete disregard for his own life, he moved out into the open, where he could gain a better position to transmit a call to get help for his men. Despite the risk, Murphy successfully made contact with Bagram Air Base, and requested assistance from the Special Operations Quick Reaction Force. As he calmly provided details of his men's location and the enemy force they were up against, he was shot in the back, causing him to briefly drop the transmitter before picking it up again and continuing to communicate with Bagram. Severely wounded, but his message having been sent, Lutral said later he heard Murphy say, Roger that, sir. Thank you. Just as two rounds ripped into his torso. Severely wounded, Murphy tried to fight on and called out to Latrell. That says, Latrell was at his breaking point. He could barely walk after his fall, and if he had attempted to reach Murphy, he would have surely been shot instantly. He dropped his gun and covered his ears as Murphy screamed out to him before he watched four of Shah's men emerge and finish off the lieutenant. Shortly after, a rocket-propelled grenade detonated between his and Axelman's position, throwing him over another ridge and leaving him unconscious and out of sight of his attackers. By the time the firefight was concluded, over two hours later, 35 of Shah's men were dead, but so too were Latrell's three comrades. The Lone Survivor After Murphy's heroic effort alerted the quick reaction force, two MH-47s were quickly scrambled to the scene using the call sign Turbine 33 and 34. On board Turbine 33 were eight additional SEALs, led by Lieutenant Commander Eric S. Christensen, and eight members of the Army's Night Stalkers. Given Murphy's report of the intensity of enemy fire, two AH-64 Apache helicopter gunships were also redirected to the area, to neutralize hostile forces and protect the large transport aircraft, as it made its effort to recover the SEAL team. Unfortunately, the Apaches were straggling behind the Chinook, and with their buddies in danger, the Special Forces team decided to press on ahead of them. As Turbine 33 approached the scene, however, disaster struck. One of Shah's men spotted the aircraft coming in low 
and turned his rocket-propelled grenade launcher on the target transport. The grenade flew through the open ramp at the rear of the aircraft and detonated inside the cargo area. It was a mortal wound. The aircraft immediately began to fall from the sky, before crashing into a mountainside, killing all 16 on board. This loss coupled with the three dead from Luttrell's team meant that June 28, 2005, went down as the darkest day of enduring freedom for the US Special Forces community. At the time, senior officers at Bagram assumed that they had lost 20 men that day, but in actuality, Luttrell was seriously wounded in both legs, but miraculously still very much alive. Having regained consciousness, he spent the night crawling through the dirt, unable to speak, and his tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth, as his throat was full of dirt. Four hours he crawled, slid, climbed and fell, while vainly sucking on any vegetation he could to try and absorb any moisture, until finally he found a waterfall. It was as he managed a few desperate gulps that to his horror he saw a group of Afghans facing him. Alarmed, he grabbed his rifle and was about to open fire when he paused as one of them gestured to him that they were unarmed and not hostile to him. He didn't know it at the time, but they were Pashtuns, the world's oldest living tribal group, and they decided to take him in and offer him aid and perhaps more importantly protection. For three days, the Pashtuns cared for him giving him food and water and tending to his wounds. Anti-coalition militia made contact with the Pashtuns looking for the American, but rather courageously, the tribesmen refused to give him up to them. Meanwhile, Latrell wrote a note which one of the Pashtuns' men carried to a nearby US Marine outpost, informing them of his survival and location. This time, US forces took no chances. A massive rescue effort was organized, involving combat aircraft and drones launching strikes against known insurgent locations to keep them off the rescue team, who successfully recovered Latrell on July 2nd, the lone survivor of the darkest day. For Ahmed Shah, the whole affair had been a triumph, but his celebrations were cut short. The US were not simply about to call time on him, and they returned in force in August 2005 under Operation Whalers, severely disrupting his group's operations although again he would escape death or capture. Then sometime in April 2008, he was killed by Pakistani police during a shootout at a security checkpoint in Khyber, Pakutunkwa, after he had kidnapped a local trader. Marcus Luttrell received the Navy Cross for his courage during the battle, whilst posthumous Navy Crosses went to Petty Officer Matthew Axe Axelson and Gunner's Mate 2nd Class Danny Dietz Jr. For his heroic effort to call for help for his men, Lieutenant Michael Murphy was awarded a posthumous Medal of Honor. And on May 7, 2011, the US Navy christened its 62nd Arleigh Burke class destroyer, the USS Michael Murphy, DDG-112. This has been Wars of the World, and that was the brief overview of Operation Red Wings. <laughs>